Taiwan calls foul over China's claim it's exposed 1,000 espionage cases. Taiwan's military is learning from Ukraine, taking on new suicide drones. Two earthquakes shake Taiwan, reminding people of the all-too-recent Hualien quake. Plus... Taiwan has welcomed back its Olympic athletes with open arms. We take a look at how they celebrated. Welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Yvonne Yang. Taiwan has slammed Chinese claims that it's found more than 1,000 cases of Taiwanese spying. China's security ministry says it's part of a campaign to strike hard against espionage. We watch reports from the Mainland Affairs Council, Taiwan's agency that deals with relations with China. Taiwan's Mainland Affairs Council says this claim of a thousand spy cases is all about Chinese bureaucrats trying to meet a performance target, and to do so they're either exaggerating or they're abusing their power. Now, the deputy head of the Mainland Affairs Council, Liang Wenjie, he says that the Chinese Communist Party is doing what it's done for decades, that is, high-ranking officials come up with a goal, and then it's up to lower-ranking officials to make that goal happen, however they may. Now, this claim of a thousand spy cases was revealed this week by China's top spy agency. They said they broke up a large number of spy networks set up by Taiwanese in China. They said that they had come across more than a thousand cases involving espionage and the theft of Chinese state secrets. And they also warned that they will continue to punish what they call Taiwan independence forces. Now here they mentioned the name of a particular individual, Yang Zhiyuan. Now he's a former Taiwanese political activist who is the first Taiwanese to be prosecuted for the crime of secession in China. He's already been in custody there for two years. Um, China is calling him a Taiwan independence leader. Well, Deputy Director Liang of the Mainland Affairs Council here, he says this is just nonsense. And he says before Yang's arrest in China, he was there teaching Chinese chess and participating in competitions. Yang is not the first Taiwanese to be prosecuted in China. Um, there's been a series of, there's been past cases of Taiwanese imprisoned for charges including subversion um, and espionage. And this idea of advocating for Taiwan independence, China has been trying to criminalize that. In June, they said that extreme cases of what they called die-hard Taiwanese separatists they would face the death penalty. So what does all this mean? Well, the Chinese and Taiwanese governments aren't talking. And every time there's news of Taiwanese being arrested in China, it puts more Taiwanese off traveling there, hampering relations between China and Taiwan, not just on a political level, but on a personal level too. Coast Guard members involved in a fatal maritime incident earlier this year will not face charges. That's after a Jinmen prosecutor ruled that there was not enough evidence to charge them for the deaths of two Chinese nationals. In February, Taiwan's Coast Guard spotted a Chinese vessel in their territorial waters and chased them away. The boat capsized in the pursuit and two of its crew were killed. Taiwan has since apologized for the incident, provided compensation and returned the boat and the bodies of those involved. Taiwan's east coast has been hit by several earthquakes in recent days, with a magnitude 6.3 tremor rattling Hualien early Friday morning. While no major damage has been reported, the threat of earthquakes is a constant presence for those living in the region. Chris Goring reports. Another earthquake strikes Hualien on Taiwan's east coast. It's the second large quake in as many days for the region, and the shaking and uncertainty have become all too familiar for the people there. 
，咬的还蛮久的，但是大家都蛮镇定。我觉得没有怕不怕呢，大自然的力量都是要敬畏。A magnitude 5.7 earthquake first struck on Thursday evening near Ilan. The following morning, an even larger 6.3 quake off the coast of Hualien. While both resulted in strong shaking, they were far smaller than April's magnitude 7.2 quake and aftershocks that resulted in at least 18 deaths and damage worth millions of dollars. No major damage has been reported following the two most recent quakes, and officials say they're not related to the one in April. 位置相当、相当、相当靠近那个我们零四零三今今年零四零三的那个正央好余震的分布区，但是因为那个零四零三那个整个余震的那个能量，我们初步判断是那个释放的已经有有一个阶段了。这个地震呢，我们不把它暂时不把它归属为说是零四零三的地震，而是一个一个那个独立的事件。But seismic experts are warning that aftershocks from large quakes are still possible. In reality, if we take a look at the, the large earthquake or gigantic earthquake around the world, it is not surprising that one large earthquake could trigger another event, maybe say months later or even years later. Earthquakes are always disturbing when they happen. But in an area as earthquake prone as Taiwan, they're just a way of life, which is why residents here have no choice but to carry on and be ready for anything. John Su and Chris Gorin for Taiwan Plus. Rare images of one of Taiwan's new military drones is showing how the country is investing in unmanned heat vehicles as it deals with threats from China. It's part of Taiwan's plan to build a drone fleet, taking inspiration from weapons used in the Ukraine war. Emil Khan reports. In a promotional video, Taiwan's military reveals one of its newest approaches to warfare. Strapping explosives to a drone, flying it through an obstacle course until it finds and hits its target. These unmanned aircraft, known as kamikaze or suicide drones, are still under development, but are a key part of efforts to modernize Taiwan's defense strategy. I think it's exciting that we're seeing real progress in Taiwan embracing. The uncrewed system revolution, uh, and really seeing some purchases and development of smaller drones like quadcopters, and I think that's a very positive step when we're talking about Taiwan uh, developing a asymmetric strategy to deter and, if necessary, defend the island. Taiwan is under threat from China, and it's been trying to find ways to boost its defense, as Beijing has a much larger military. One strategy is to shift away from older, more traditional systems like tanks and fighter jets. Instead, investing in asymmetric capabilities like drones. Drones like this quadcopter cost roughly a thousand U.S. dollars, much cheaper than a fighter jet, which go for millions of dollars. Given the threat Taiwan faces, analysts say the country will need to incorporate both kinds of systems into its overall approach. 因为我们之前有解释过 ，asymmetric， 呃呃，这个 strategy 跟这个 conventional strategy， 其实它是一个 mix 混合的哦。那在台湾来讲，目前当然是这是 more priority 更优先，也就是参考乌克兰成功的经验，它用很 low cost 或 low budget 去改装。Taiwan has been looking closely at how Ukraine is using drones in its efforts to push back against Russia's invasion. There are now plans to build what the defense ministry calls a drone fleet, taking commercially available drones and upgrading them to a military standard. What's cool about um, this capability set in particular, and again, sort of what we've seen in the Ukraine case as well, is these systems are all super easy to operate. I think for Taiwan, it's a good strategy because at the end of the day, this is about flooding the zone. It's about using large numbers of small things、um, that will really help. You know, punch China where they're the most vulnerable. Taiwan is getting ready to conduct its first live-fire test of newly produced kamikaze drones on Monday. If all goes well, mass production could begin in 2025, getting Taiwan's forces better prepared to deal with threats from across the Taiwan Strait. Andy Shui and Hamio Khan for Taiwan Plus. A petition to recall Jilong's mayor is moving ahead after successfully gaining enough signatures. The Central Election Commission made the announcement on Friday, setting the vote date for October 13th. 
Jidong residents delivered their petition to recall George Xie in June. It follows months of political standoff in Jilong after the city council questioned Xie about allegations of abuse of power, a real estate deal, and broken campaign promises. The opposition Taiwan People's Party and its leader, former presidential candidate Ke Wenzhe, have been rocked by a corruption scandal this week. The party stands accused of falsely reporting accounts valuing hundreds of thousands of U.S. dollars. It's the latest setback for the TPP since they shook up Taiwanese politics in January's elections. And to learn more, Ed Moon spoke to political analyst Corney Donovan-Smith. Ke Wenzhe and his Taiwan People's Party have had a very difficult week. Can you tell us a little bit about this latest scandal? This whole thing broke, and this is two, um, I guess you could say, influencers. And the two of them did some investigating into uh, the TPP's finances, and, the, and then the TPP had to hold a press conference admitting there were irregularities in 17 entries uh, for over 18 million NT. So big questions about you know, these irregularities. Now, the party claimed that the, the, these were accounting errors. And then at, at the same time, uh, more details start coming out. So, for example, um, a lunchbox is costing 900 and some odd thousand spent on tissues, uh, 400 and some odd thousand spent at one campaign rally in Tainan. Kerr has tried to build his brand based on efficient governance and clean governance. Do you think these scandals are something that he can possibly recover from, or is it going to be too much? It really looks very bad that, you know, Ann Gao, his vice mayor, the companies that he, you know, hands all of his marketing to, you know, the, the, all these people around him that he presumably chose are being investigated for corruption. Now, if they're found guilty, that will be a pretty serious blow to people's um, perception of his abilities uh, to run anything, really. Um, but if it if this goes up the chain and he becomes embroiled in it, um, you know, then definitely his career is finished. Now, I don't know if he can bounce back even from just surrounding himself by corrupt people. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know. Again, we're going to have to see how this plays out. Kerr and the TPP surprised a lot of people with their strong performance in January's elections, getting 20% of the vote countrywide. Where do you think those supporters are going to go now if they decide that they don't want to keep supporting Kerr and the TPP? And I think that I think that the third part of, of your question there's probably what's going to happen with a lot of these people. A lot of them are going to go back to being independents who may lean one way or lean a, another. Um, I think that ultimately... The kind of people who supported the TPP, I think, ultimately are looking for a third party. And if a viable new third party were to appear, I think that they might go toward that. But I think that really there is a hunger out there among a certain percentage of the voting public for something that is not the DPP and something that is not the KMT. That was political analyst Corney Donovan-Smith. Thailand's parliament has voted in Petong Tan Shinawat as the country's next prime minister, just two days after the constitutional court ousted former prime minister Seta Tavising on ethics violations. Tiffany Wong reports. Thailand's new prime minister Petong Tan Shinawat faces the crowd for the first time in her new role. She takes over two days after former prime minister Seta Tavising was ousted by the constitutional court. I hope that I can do my best to, you know, make the country go forward. That's, that's what I, that's what I, I try, I try to do. And um, right now, of course, today is, I feel very honored and I feel very happy. 37-year-old Pe Tong Tan is the daughter of Thailand's former premier Thaksin Shinawat. She is the third member of her family to lead the country and the youngest prime minister in the country's history. Pe Tong Tan was a candidate for the ruling Pe Thai party last year, but that party shifted its support to Seda. Less than a year later, she's now taken his place as prime minister, with the support of nearly two-thirds of the House, including party members and its partners, against no other alternative candidates. 
ได้รับคะแนนเห็นชอบมากกว่ากึ่งหนึ่งของจำนวนสมาชิกสภาเท่าที่มีอยู่ทั้งหมดของสภาผู้แทนราษฎรครับนะดังนั้นจึงถือว่ามติของสภาได้เห็นชอบเพื่อเสนอแต่งตั้งนักสาวแพรตองทานชินวัตรเป็นนายกตีตามรัฐนูนมาตรา159ต่อไปนะครับ Now the country's future is in Pei Tong Tan's hands, but she faces an uphill battle as her position faces heavy scrutiny from both the military and the monarchy, and the constitutional court which supports it. All of which her father's party has aimed to appease in recent years to varying degrees of success. As Pei Tong Tan takes office, Thailand will be watching to see how long she's able to hold the people's support while balancing demands from the military and monarchy. Devon Tsai and Tiffany Wong for Taiwan Plus. China's Gen Z is coming of age, but facing long work hours and mounting economic pressure, these young workers are turning towards a way of life with ancient roots. Jonathan Kaplan takes a closer look at China's wellness industry. Plastering the streets of Shanghai, ads for vitamins, probiotics, and mushroom supplements, part of a boom in China's wellness industry. Chinese medicine practitioner Zhang Jinghua is teaching adults about reproductive health. She says she's filling a gap in knowledge about general health. I think young people are more and more interested in health, are interested in their 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 health. This also shows that the young people are more and more interested in their health. Why are they more interested in their health? It shows that they have already felt that they have this lack of knowledge. China's Gen Z and Millennials are turning their focus towards their health. And the concept of Yangsheng, cultivating one's life force, is appealing to overworked urbanites. One of Zhang's students says the traditional medicine classes are revealing new ways to look after herself. With growing economic woes and sky-high housing prices, young workers are feeling squeezed. Combined with lingering anxieties from years of battling COVID in China, the younger generation is turning toward their health. As a way to maintain their own sense of balance and control. But these kinds of health solutions are nothing new. China has the world's second largest health and wellness industry, worth more than 680 billion U.S. dollars. And the first Chinese medicine practices date back to 200 BCE. But the rise of online influencers is fueling a new type of demand within the industry. Whether a trend or a traditional way of life, China's young people face an uncertain economic future. But they're refocusing on what they feel may be their best investment, their health and longevity. Scott Huang and Jonathan Kaplan for Taiwan Plus. Three years since the withdrawal of the United States and Allied forces, China has made inroads into Afghanistan while growing its footprint in the conflict-torn country. China now considers Taliban-led Afghanistan pivotal for its geopolitical strategy in South and Central Asia. To learn more about how Beijing is shaping the geopolitics of the region, our reporter Adele Brar spoke to Associate Professor Jabin Jacob from the Shif Ndar University in India. Has China filled the void after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? China is one of the few countries perhaps that is actually actively willing to court or engage with the Taliban. So in that sense, the Chinese have certainly filled the void insofar as legitimacy for the Taliban is concerned. Have China's commercial activities since the withdrawal of the U.S. helped rebuild Afghanistan's economy? So far, uh, the only major uh, sort of economic project that has come to light is the uh, sort of restarting of the mess in a copper mine project. And that too is just the beginning of the construction of a road to the mines. Now, according to the Afghans themselves, the Taliban government itself, it's be at least a couple of years before copper is actually extracted from the mine. 
So this is still a long way to go. But clearly the Chinese are wanting to move forward in exploiting what by many accounts is a rather large uh, mineral wealth that Afghanistan holds. So this is probably the first step. Will China accept Taliban into the Belt and Road Initiative because no decision on its membership has been announced yet? I think one of the issues, I mean, even now as well as then, is the sort of state of relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And because there are tensions in that relationship, I think there are many parts of this exercise, uh, you know, the expansion of the BRI in Afghanistan or the connection of Afghanistan with Pakistan in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. A lot of those things are going slow or are stalled because of tensions in the Afghan-Pakistan relationship. And I think the Chinese are also trying to mediate in some form or the other between the two sides, but this is going to be very difficult uh, for the Chinese to achieve. How does China's presence in Afghanistan help with its broader strategic goals in the wider Central Asian region? China's presence, China's influence in Afghanistan also matters insofar as China's relations with the Central Asian countries is concerned, which is also which also explains you know why China has such close ties with the Iranians because again Iran provides an outlet for Central Asian countries to see to the outside world. But given the nature of the Taliban regime, you know its Islamist nature, the presence of terrorist organizations, fundamentalist organizations, some of which are sort of aligned against uh, ruling regimes in Central Asia. Uh, this is not going to be easy uh, for the Chinese. That was Associate Professor Jabin Jacob from Shif Nadar University. An employee at a Taipei kindergarten has been found guilty on more than 200 counts of sexually abusing children. As Chris Goran reports, the case has sent shockwaves through Taiwan's education system. Mao Junshen, a former employee at a Taipei kindergarten, arrives at court. Not long after, he was found guilty of more than 200 counts of sexually assaulting and secretly filming children. All six victims were under seven years old. Due to concurrent sentencing, he will effectively serve 28 years in prison. Many of the crimes took place at Mao's workplace, a Taipei preschool and kindergarten owned by his mother. On the administrative side, several officials in the city government have been reprimanded for not catching the case sooner or handling it poorly, and they have established a new unit to publicize any unqualified personnel in schools. Child safety groups say that better communication is needed to prevent abuse cases like this from falling through the cracks. As Taiwan works to better protect its children, officials are hoping that these new measures can at least bring such cases to light a little sooner. Joseph Wu and Chris Gorin for Taiwan Plus. Fans of Taiwan's national team were treated to quite a spectacle as the country's Olympic athletes paraded through Taipei. Our reporter Sandy Chi was there. From the Arc de Triomphe to a train through Taipei, Taiwan's Olympians marched through Taiwan's capital on Friday, celebrating their performance at the Paris Summer Games. The national team, competing under the name Chinese Taipei, bagged a total of seven medals this year, two gold and five bronze. To honor their achievements, Taiwan's presidential office held this party and parade. Athletes and their coaches, and for the first time, some of their family members were all invited. They met Taiwan's President Lai Qingde at the presidential office building before kicking off the event. After meeting the president, they took to the streets, led by a police motorcade and several marching bands. They march from the presidential office along Taipei's major roads. I'm here at Hero Valley, the section of the parade, with athletes behind me going down the streets to greet their fans. And our organizers have handed out thousands of beach plaques for the 
public to get into the spirit at the event. And as you can feel beside me, the atmosphere is going wild. The people are excited about their athletes and cheering for them. Fans poured out of their offices to take time out of the day to express their support for their favorite athletes. The parade proved to be quite an experience for the athletes as well. Taekwondo star Luo Jialing spoke after the parade. For many of Taiwan's athletes, this parade concludes this year's Summer Games. Eight walked away with medals to ending this chapter in Taiwanese sport on a high note. With the next Summer Games, Los Angeles 2028, just four years away, Team Taiwan will now get ready and head to Hollywood. Patrick Chan and Sandy Chi for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Finally, check out more footage of Taiwan's Olympic Victory Parade. I'm Yvonne Yang, take care, and I'll see you next time.